Thank you, Dean Baumgartner, for that very informative and engaging presentation. That is my boss's boss. Um, and thank you all for participating in this first session of um, our two days to reflect on the life and legacy of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. My name is Greg Lee. I'm a new professor here in theology um, at Wheaton College. We have two wonderful speakers for us um, ahead of us this morning, Dr. Philip Ziegler and Dr. Keith Johnson. Each will have 45 minutes for his presentation and then we'll have 30 minutes for a question and discussion. So let me introduce our first speaker. Dr. Philip Ziegler is Senior Lecturer in Systematic Theology at the University of Aberdeen, Scotland, where he serves as the head of the School of Divinity, History, and Philosophy. He is the author of Doing Theology When God is Forgotten, The Theological Achievement of Wolf Krukha, published in 2006 through Peter Lang, which is a study of the trajectory of the theologies of Barth and Bonhoeffer within the aggressively um, disestablished Protestant churches of East Germany. Dr. Ziegler's interests include the dogmatic bases of theological ethics and politics and the ongoing significance of the theological legacy of the German church struggle, including the work of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. We're very glad to have him here with us. Dr. Ziegler's presentation is titled, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a Theologian of the Word of God. Thank you very much indeed, Gregory, for that generous introduction, and good morning, everyone. Um, one quick notice before I begin. I'll be referencing throughout the paper uh, two documents, uh, one, the Barman Theological Declaration, and a second one, the, uh, the Dalem uh, uh, Synod Declaration, neither of which you, you may have ever read in detail. Um, I produced about 50 copies of both, and they're, they're left at the back on the registration table. So if your uh, curiosity is piqued by what I say about Bonhoeffer's relationship to these texts, uh, please do feel free to pick one up on the way out and take, take yourself to school. Okay, so my topic uh, is what kind of theologian was Dietrich Bonhoeffer? Um, what commanded his attention in matters of Christian doctrine? From whence did his theological thinking and writing proceed? And at what did it aim? I was asked by the conveners of this conference to help us to begin to ask and answer these kinds of questions in this first talk this morning. I do so aware that more than half a century after Bonhoeffer's execution in Flossenburg in April 1945, women and men by their thousands continue to be fascinated by the story of his life and death and moved by the integration of clear Christian conviction, civil courage, and moral leadership, which mark him out as an extraordinary figure in recent church history. This capacity of Bonhoeffer's life story to continue to seize imaginations is remarkable and welcome. And yet, amongst the, the proliferating portraits of this Protestant saint, it is more than possible to lose sight of Bonhoeffer's central vocation as a theologian. It can be difficult for contemporary readers to access and to understand the character and the substance and the import of Bonhoeffer's work as a teacher of Christian doctrine in its historical context, and this despite the fact that we're very well positioned to do just that, possessed as we are now of a complete critical edition of his writings and many very historiographically sophisticated studies of the landscape of church and theology in early 20th century Germany. The, the decisive context for understanding Bonhoeffer's theological identity are, I think, two. The first and more narrow is the German church struggle of the 1930s and its wider ecumenical environment in which Bonhoeffer was immersed. The struggle for the integrity of the Protestant churches in Germany under Nazism was a matter of burning concern for Bonhoeffer, and he aligned himself from the very first with its most radical proponents and served its cause right up to the time of his imprisonment. Explaining his decision to return to Germany from, from America in the summer of 1939, Bonhoeffer wrote to his Swiss friend Edwin Sutz simply, I am being pulled irresistibly back toward the confessing church. The second and wider context within which to understand his profile as a theologian is that provided by the intellectual ferment of European Protestant thought during the first decades of the 20th century. Bonhoeffer learned and practiced his theological art amidst the churn of the high liberal theology of his Berlin teachers, impulses from the contemporary Luther Renaissance, as it was called, 
and the explosive de developments of crisis or dialectical theology of which Karl Barth was a leading exponent. In my re remarks this morning, I want to recommend that we approach Bonhoeffer as a theologian of the word of God in order to illumine something crucial of the form and the substance and the scope of his theology as a whole as it can be seen within these two particular contexts. The phrase word of God is a compact and polyvalent designation for the, the very center of Bonhoeffer's theology and provides, I suggest, a key for its interpretation. A theology of the word of God comprises several motifs. It sets out from acknowledgement of revelation understood as a divine performative address which judges and forgives and commands. It sees this divine activity concentrated definitively in the person of Jesus Christ. Attending to the Bible as a unique creaturely medium of the word, such a th theology affirms the concreteness and the contemporaneity of God's promise and claim. It does so because it, it acknowledges the vital and eloquent presence of Christ to the world. Given that God's word of redemption determines the very reality of the world in some deep sense, such theology seeks further to discern the contours of the world as it has been remade by grace and to reflect upon the shape of a truly human life lived therein. As Bonhoeffer once wrote, revelation gives itself without precondition and is alone able to place one into reality. So whether treating of the doctrine of God, the doctrine of salvation, the doctrines of the church, or the matter of the Christian life, the vocation of the theologian of the word of God is always to hold reason in obedience to Jesus Christ. For again, as Bonhoeffer said, the relevant is and begins where God himself is in his word. The prospect for an authentic and powerful Christian theology exists, Bonhoeffer argued, as long as only one word, that is to say the name of Jesus Christ, is not extinguished in us. This name abides as a word, the word, around which all our words revolve. In this word alone, he concludes, lies clarity and power. My concentrated effort here to profile Bonhoeffer as a theologian of the word of God involves two steps. First, I offer some remarks concerning Bonhoeffer's relationship with the theologies of Martin Luther and Karl Barth, two great formative practitioners of the theology of the word. Second, I explore some tracts of Bonhoeffer's corpus with which you might not be so familiar, but which represent his main theological preoccupations throughout the extended engagement in the German church struggle. Here, I focus in particular on his vigorous embrace of the truths attested in the Barman Theological Declaration of 1934, the chief fighting text, as it were, of that struggle. Reflecting on the intensity and focus of Bonhoeffer's devotion to Barman as a confession of the church may help serve to illuminate simultaneously the crucial importance of scripture in Bonhoeffer's theology, as well as the unshakable centrality of Jesus Christ, the present and powerful word of God's own freedom ever addressing itself to the church. While not perhaps exactly evangelical in the sense that this term now carries broadly in English language usage, Bonhoeffer's theology, I want to argue, is profoundly evangelisch in the historic sense of that term in its European use, usage, which is to say that his theology is a sustained effort to hear afresh the substance and the significance of the Pauline and Lutheran faith and to attain to a better witness to the gospel of God, which has been honored, as he once said, by, quote, all genuine Christian thinking from Paul, Augustine, Luther, to Kierkegaard, and Barth. So his, his own chosen lineage. <laughs> right. Between Martin Luther and Karl Barth. Bonhoeffer, as we heard from the dean, was a highly cultured European intellectual of his time. Widely read, musically talented and trained, uncommonly well-traveled, excellent at tennis, fond of smoking, he, he was a prolific amateur in the best sense, in the study of languages and literature, philosophy, history, popular scientific writing. His family home and formal education led to theological studies in the leading German faculties of the day, most importantly, as we heard, in Berlin, where he worked under world-leading modern historians of the Christian tradition, including Karl Hohl, Reinhold Zieberg, and Adolf von Harnack. 
While Bonhoeffer would ever acknowledge his personal debt to his Berlin teachers, he came rather quickly to chafe against them, and he steadily moved beyond their theological ambit through the influence chiefly of two encounters, on the one hand with Martin Luther, and on the other hand with Karl Barth. Having previously only known Barth from his writings, Bonhoeffer enthused about his first meetings with the older Swiss theologian in Bonn in 1931. He said this, there is really someone from whom one takes away much, and yet here I sit in the impoverished Berlin and complain because no one is here who can teach theology at all. When you see Bart, you know at once that there is something worthwhile to risk your life for. It's fair to say that Bart was for Bonhoeffer the most significant contemporary theological authority, and that he wrote his own theology with Bart always in mind. Right up into the late years of the war, Bonhoeffer described himself as one of Barth's few loyal advocates, his phrase, in Germany, and saw to it that he both visited Barth and acquired proof copies of the newest volumes of the church dogmatics on each of his trips to, to Switzerland. His criticisms of Barth, present forthrightly from the outset of his published work, though varied in content over the years, were ever, I think, fraternal and friendly looking for ways to do b yet better justice to the promise of the essential theological convictions which they shared, chief among them the primacy, particularity, and concreteness of God's gracious self-revelation in Jesus Christ as the formal and material principle of all good Christian theology. From his d dissertation criticisms of what he considered Barth's abstract view of God's freedom through to the late prison worries about the atrophy of the theology of, th of the confessing church into a positivism of revelation for which Barth was in some sense responsible. Bonhoeffer aimed always to take Barth's insights and to drive them further. Be beginning with act and being, Bonhoeffer openly aligns himself with Barth's struggle to reaffirm the sheer contingency of divine revelation, and on this basis, to understand theology itself as a form of th thinking decisively shaped by the utterly gracious and effective reality of revelation in Christ. Though he disagreed with Barth over various particulars, disputing, for example, the place of dialectics in theology, as well as certain more reformed elements of Barth's Christology and theology proper, Bonhoeffer always affirmed the central thrust of Barth's theological revolution. This view of revelation must, Bonhoeffer said, yield an epistemology of its own, in which we know ourselves only as people who have been placed into the truth by God's address, and thus admit that our own existence is founded by means of and in reference to God's word. Christian theology must be a theology of the word of God because Christian faith itself arises from this source or does not arise at all. Now both Bonhoeffer's alignment to and his arguments with Barth on such matters have their mainsprings, I think, in the influence of Martin Luther. Recent scholarship is increasingly alert to the abiding influence of Luther and the uh, theological traditions of classical Lutheranism upon Bonhoeffer. Luther remained for Bonhoeffer a living dialogue partner and is the most frequently cited theologian in all of Bonhoeffer's writing. The German church was for Bonhoeffer essentially a Lutheran church, which is to say a church of the Reformation. For this reason, Bonhoeffer's theology self-consciously engages in the protracted debate concerning the reception and interpretation of Luther's legacy for the church in modern Germany. From the time of his two dissertations, Bonhoeffer repudiates his teacher Karl Hohl's widely influential portrait of Luther as the progenitor of the religion of individual conscience. And he does this precisely because he understands that Hohl illegit illegitimately circumvents, as he says, Luther's insistence that God has bound the divine self to the mediating word. So the, the worry is right at the heart of the question of the theology of the word. Then in works like Discipleship, he openly polemicizes against misunderstandings and abuse of Luther's teaching on radical grace, good works, and indeed throughout the whole period of the church struggle, he refutes as merely pseudo-Lutheran the racialist exploitation and distortion of the doctrines of the two regiments and the orders of creation. He consistently called upon his students to rediscover the authentic teaching of the reformer. They should, he said at some point, just listen to the Bible, just read what Luther wrote. <laughs> and, 
And they should do that because in confusing times, we should, he said, go back to the very beginning to our wellsprings, to the true Bible, to the true Luther. This true Luther was, of course, for Bonhoeffer, simply an exquisite listener to the Bible, uh, uh, an excellent exegete of the scriptures. And what Luther heard in the gospel was the gracious promise of divine righteousness in Christ. The most decisive thing that Bonhoeffer took over from Luther was precisely this insistence on the solus Christus. The Christian thinks and speaks of God evangelically only as she thinks and speaks of Jesus Christ, the word of God come low in humility to save. For this reason, becoming a theologian, Bonhoeffer said, involves responsible study and listening to the witness of scripture in order to become attentive to the word of God which has, as he, as he said, been revealed right here in this world. We, we do well to note that Bonhoeffer emphasizes that the word comes right here in this world. This stress on the concreteness of the worldly sight of our encounter with God is something that Bonhoeffer learned from Luther. A theology of the word of God is concerned precisely for this gospel truth in the midst of and for the sake of this created and fallen world. At the conclusion of his 1931-32 lectures on the recent history of Christian systematic theology, Bonhoeffer laments the disjunction between the work of academic theology on the one hand and the present situation of the churches on the other. Observing that Luther himself had been perfectly able to preach powerfully into the church's need in his own time and write uh, technical theology of a high order, Bonhoeffer ends his lecture with this rhetorical plea, who will show us Luther? Well, we, I think we can rightly say that in some sense, Bonhoeffer labored to provide an answer to his own question in his own subsequent theological work. Central to this effort was his theological leadership in the Confessing Church and his advocacy for the strong reading of the Barman Theological Declaration advanced by the so-called Dolomite part, Party to which he publicly subscribed. Moving now to to consider several key themes of Bonhoeffer's work in that vein, we may come to see more sharply the overarching importance of his self-understanding as a theologian of the word of God. There we are. Now, in a circular letter from October 1935, Bonhoeffer describes the establishment of the preacher's seminary in Finkenwalde, including its physical appointments and its setting. Amidst the utterly plain and functional furnishings of the rooms which served as lecture hall, dining hall, and chapel all at once, Bonhoeffer notes that, quote, on the wall hang the two great portraits of the apostles by Durer. That's them there. Bonhoeffer calls them great, presumably not only because of their size, though they are two meters tall if reproduced to scale, but also because of the significance of their subject matter. The paintings, which were uh, or originally done by Durer as a gift to the city council of Nuremberg in 1526, depict four apostles in two, two pairs. Uh, to the left, John and Peter. To the right, sorry, this way, Mark and Paul. Though intended for, from the first to be displayed in magistrates' buildings, both the subject matter and the monumental size of the, the images are redolent of a painted altarpiece. At the base of each, Durer had inscribed the text of four biblical passages in Luther's translation from 2 Peter 2, 1 John 4, Mark 12, and 2 Timothy 3. At the head of all the scriptural verses, though, he had the calligrapher set this preface. Uh, it worked. In these dangerous times, all worldly rulers should take care that they do not mistake human seduction for the word of God. For God wants nothing to be taken from or added to it. Therefore, hear these four excellent men, Peter, John, Paul, and Mark. In the original polemical context, the paintings constituted a Reformation broadside, aimed to refute both visually and verbally Catholic and enthusiastic challenges to the principle of sola scriptura. In the different but no less polemical context of the German church struggle, Bonhoeffer's decision to set up these very same images at the heart of the seminary at Finkenwalde is no less of a broadside. It's aimed, of course, at the German evangelical church as instrumentalized by the Nazis, at the German Christian movement, and latterly also towards the so-called compromise party within the confessing church itself. It's aimed, in short, at all of the opponents of Barman and Dahlem for the sake of affirming what was confessed by those two synods. 
Bonhoeffer was deeply convicted by the evangelical truths of Barman and their radical implications for church order and government drawn out at Dahlem. And his position in the debates surrounding them was radically and uncompromisingly one-sided. It was Bonhoeffer's bold conviction that the Holy Spirit had stirred the church to join the battle at a specific place and had brought about what he called a true confession of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, we can no longer go back behind Barman and Dahlem because we can no longer go back behind the word of God. Durer's four apostles, together with its subscription, I suggest, might be taken to epitomize Bonhoeffer's theological program during the years of the church struggle. His writing and teaching, especially after 1933, is a single sustained effort to hear these four excellent men which is to say, to suffer the full force of the promise and the claim of the gospel attested in scripture. In the same letter in which he mentions Durer's paintings, Bonhoeffer explains to his, his correspondent that, quote, the Bible stands at the focal point of our labor. For us, it has become once more the starting point and the center of our theological endeavor and all our Christian activity. Here, we have learned to read the Bible prayerfully once again. Now, Bonhoeffer works out his allegiance to, to Barman in no small part by advocating relentlessly for the centrality and exclusivity of the biblical witness as the locus of Christ's self-presentation to and for the Christian church. His concern is ever with the force of the first of the articles of the Declaration, which confesses, there it is, that Jesus Christ, as he's attested for us in Holy Scripture, is the one word of God which we have to hear and which we have to trust and obey in life and in death. It is no doubt true and important, as John de Grucci and many others have argued, that Bonhoeffer served the cause of Barman by drawing out, very specifically, its practical and political consequences for the church in the Third Reich, and that in so doing, he made himself one of the main links between that confession of faith and contemporary struggles for justice and peace in the world. And it is also true that Bonhoeffer's involvement with the nascent organs of the ecumenical movement helped to bring the ecclesiological substance of Barman into view both at that time and since. Yet at the heart of all of this was an even more basic struggle, namely the struggle to hear, to trust, and to obey the one word of God attested in scripture as God's unparalleled assurance of our forgiveness and his royal claim upon our whole life as the second article of the Barman Declaration has it. If it's not too much to claim that the record of Finkenwalde itself represents an essential part of Bonhoeffer's responsible interpretation of Barman, then we should find this radical concern for the word at the heart of the church to be borne out in texts from this period. And so we do. These works evince that Bonhoeffer understood that the question put to the church at Barman was first and foremost the question of the truth of the word of God. In allegiance to this confession, this question, the question of the truth that Jesus Christ is and the formative power of his particularity, became Bonhoeffer's own most concern. Some few examples will, I think, suffice to demonstrate that this was the case. On the eve of the start of the first course at Finkenwalde, Bonhoeffer addressed a confessing church gathering in Saxony on the theme of the interpretation of the New Testament. In his lecture, Bonhoeffer sets the struggle for the truth of the living and present witness of Christ through his appointed witness, the Bible, over against all efforts to justify Christianity to the present age. The church as church cannot forfeit its proper concern for evangelical truth, Bonhoeffer stresses, in favor of an overriding concern for relevance. As he says there, quote, where the question of relevance becomes the theme of theology, we can be certain that the cause has already been betrayed and sold out. Now, why should that be? Programmatic concern for relevance grants to the world, rather than the word, the status of decisive reality. It effectively fetters the unfettered word of God and affords the present, in Bonhoeffer's case, the so-called German hour of the church, de facto status as another source of divine promise and claim, which delimits the hearing of the word and channels the church's message and action. 
put otherwise, to pursue relevant theology in the sense that Bonhoeffer thinks of here, is to confess the perspicacity of our social and political contexts and the obscurity of the scriptures rather than the other way around. Against this, Bonhoeffer argues that what is truly relevant is and begins where God himself is in his word. The relevant fact, as he puts it, is the present presence of the spirit, who, as the subject of biblical interpretation, commits the church to attend afresh to the biblical witness as the sole and exclusive means, his phrase, by which Christ speaks. The word of God is present to the church in the power of the spirit, and Christ comes upon his people in the proclamation of the gospel with power to judge, to command, and to forgive. So the adventitious word provides the really relevant criteria for discerning the truth of the present situation. Bonhoeffer stresses, it will always be therefore an alien gospel, a gospel which comes upon us over and against us from outside us, which will prove itself to be the supremely relevant context in each and every case. So what makes Christian truth relevant, and this for Bonhoeffer means concrete, rampant, critical, able to arrest, to turn around, to sanctify women and men, what makes it relevant is the same thing that makes it formative and effective, namely that it is the real and eloquent presence of Christ himself as Lord and Judge and Savior. Of this he writes, precisely because the so-called concrete situation of the congregation is not taken with utmost seriousness, there is room to see the true situation of humanity before God. God does not ask us about our being men or women or national socialists. He asks us about our faith in him and his forgiving love and our obedience towards the word which is witnessed in the Bible. In short, inasmuch as the church in its listening to scripture really takes the text as a testimony to the living Christ, it, it will discover, he says, everything is here. The view Bonhoeffer advances is, of course, redolent of Barth's famous injunction about the, sal the salutary merit of doing theology as if nothing had happened. And like Barth's track, Bonhoeffer aims to heighten the human and political significance of Christian theology precisely by demanding that theology, as he put it, mind its own business. But its business, of course, is to keep abreast in thought and speech with the word of God, which is pressing upon the entire world over which Christ is Lord. Right? The path to, to relevance is to stay with the word. So he says, the Bible knows nothing of the pathos and problem or the question about our path. Our path follows self-evidently, plainly, and necessarily from the truth that is witnessed to. Our path does not have its own weight, its own problem, and certainly not its own particular tragic aspect. It is simply doing the truth, whereby the emphasis is entirely on the truth. Now what's critical in all of this is, as Bonhoeffer says, that through the Bible, in its fragility, God comes to meet us as the risen one. Such a view of the centrality and the exclusivity of the truth of scriptures in the life of the church is only credible when the biblical witness is understood to be at the disposal of Jesus Christ, the living word of God, present in the present, addressing himself to his people. Out with such a robust theology of the living word, Bonhoeffer's exclusive privileging of the scriptures would dissolve into an obscurantism, which in its longing to be spared the need for faith is all too readily exploited by the powers of the age. But to listen for the one word of God attested in the scriptures is to hearken to the voice of the risen one himself, who, as Bonhoeffer stressed, summons us to the venture of faith and obedience. That's a arresting, the venture of faith and, and obedience, and then also strengthens us by the power of his spirit for the same. Precisely this is the motive force, I think, behind Bonhoeffer's provocative remark, at least in this audience, that verbal inspiration is a poor surrogate for the resurrection. Right. With origins reaching back as far as Bonhoeffer's time at Union in 1929 and 30, his discipleship, published in 1937, can rightly be read as an exemplary iteration of his theological concerns during these most intense years of the church struggle. Like the occasional pieces which I've been considering to this point, it is also a work which clearly displays the depth of Bonhoeffer's commitment to a responsible interpretation of the Barman Declaration. 
Further, it continues to, to demonstrate the priority over all other matters, which Bonhoeffer gives to the truth of the gospel understood as a fruit of the living word of God. Here, we'll attend just briefly to the two short prefaces which Bonhoeffer set at the heads of part one and part two of that work. These prefaces are late compositions, written, it seems, during the summer of 1937, just prior to the closure of the seminary at Finkenwalde. They breathe the same polemical air as the other works from these years of crisis, and they concentrate just as clearly on the sorts of themes which I've been canvassing for you this morning. Now, you could be forgiven for thinking that the opening words of discipleship are the famous programmatic claim, cheap grace, you can say it with me if you want, but cheap grace is the mortal en enemy of our church, our struggle is for costly grace. But in fact, those aren't the first words of the book. The, the discussion of grace is preceded by introductory remarks whose brevity belies their significance. The opening words of the book are in fact these. In times of church renewal, Holy Scripture naturally becomes richer in content for us. Addressing himself explicitly to the church struggle, Bonhoeffer says that the most basic labor of the Christian community is always its most important one, namely to brush aside the many, his phrase, dissonant sounds, so many human harsh words, so many false hopes and consolations, which still obscure the pure word of Jesus. But there is but one hope to see that done, and Bonhoeffer trumpets it here. Let us be led back to scripture, to the word and the call of Jesus Christ himself, he says, for the only sure defense against the enemies of the gospel is the overpowering and winning word of the gospel itself. Only this same word is able to lift us out of his description, the poverty and narrowness of our own convictions and questions, and to put our feet once again down in that broad place, referencing Psalm 37, opened up by the calling and the promise of the living Lord. Once again, Bonhoeffer sees that the word of God must overtake and overreach the putative demands of our situation in order for truth and freedom for faithfulness, i.e. for discipleship, to emerge. The crucial discrimination he goes to draw out between cheap and costly grace is one which can only be discerned in a fresh hearing of the gracious voice of the Lord Jesus Christ or cannot be discerned or be discerned at all. In the second short preface, set at the head of his discussion of the Pauline texts in the final part of discipleship, Bonhoeffer points up once again the cardinal error that underwrites the frantic pursuit of contextual relevance for Christianity. What all anxious questioning about the appropriateness, the applicability, or the force of the gospel bespeaks is the fact that we place ourselves outside, as he says, the living presence of Christ. Our handling of scripture evinces all too clearly that Quote, we refuse to take seriously that Jesus Christ is not dead, but alive and still speaking to us today through the testimony of scripture. But Christ is present, calling his people to discipleship. And just as by the spirit, the first disciples looked to their master, believed and followed, so too, Bonhoeffer says, we hear the word, believe and get up. Held firmly within the context of the reality of Christ's present presence, the scriptures are understood once again to bear the clear word and command of the Lord himself. They become the means by which we are encountered by him. So, heeding the call to discipleship demands that the follower first and foremost listen to the proclaimed word. Because, as Bonhoeffer says, the Christ who is present with us is the Christ to whom the whole of scripture testifies. Bonhoeffer is a perfect Lutheran in saying that faith together with this discipleship, come through hearing, as Paul said. And hearing, as Paul also said, comes through the word of Christ. In such remarks as these, we hear once again the distinctive echoes of the Barman Declaration. And these prefaces specify the one word of God as the single basis for the gripping account of the Christian life, which Bonhoeffer goes on to develop in the rest of the discipleship. Although the themes of discipleship and church community are often taken to be Bonhoeffer's primary concerns, it's no small thing to keep in view that their importance is in fact derivative, falling on from a finally more basic concern with the hearing of the one word of God, the present address of the living Lord of the church. Right, so to conclude, what kind of a theologian was Dietrich Bonhoeffer? I've endeavored to show that one important answer to this question must be a theologian of the word of God. This category registers his formative indebtedness 
and living dialogue with the theologies of Martin Luther and Karl Barth, as well as his unstinting allegiance to the radical application of the evangelical confession of the Barman Declaration within the German church struggle. Materially, it draws attention to the central and abiding role played in Bonhoeffer's thought by the utterly gracious and concrete self-revelation of God in Jesus Christ. As the word of God incarnate, Jesus Christ represents the very enactment of divine transcendence, not its forfeiture or its compromise. In him, God addresses himself to the fallen world of Adam with saving effect, bringing about a new reality, namely, as he'll stress in the ethics, the one reality of the world reconciled and made new. With Luther, Bonhoeffer radically concentrates Christian attention solely on the person of Jesus Christ, because in him, God declares himself to be utterly for us. As he wrote in the prison letters, what we imagine a God could and should do, the God of Jesus Christ has nothing to do with any of that. We must immerse ourselves again and again for a long time and quite calmly in Jesus' life, his sayings, actions, suffering and dying in order to recognize what God promises and fulfills. Christian dogmatics must therefore cleave to the confession that Jesus Christ is God and admit, as he says, that the is may not be interpreted any further. For having been established it, by the incarnation, it must stand as the premise of all our thinking and not be subject to any further constructions, as he puts it. Now, the evangelical promise always addresses us from outside through the appointed witness of the scriptures, which stand fully in Bonhoeffer's telling in the service of the risen and crucified one the one who is uniquely present in the power of his person as the word of God's forgiveness and claim and direction. In the spirit of Durer's painting of the four apostles, Bonhoeffer's theology pursues relevance precisely by way of an ever greater concentration on listening for Christ's voice as, it, as it's to be heard in the manifold biblical witness and to discern it over against the voice of the stranger. As Bonhoeffer himself says, God's spirit battles only through the word of scripture and of confession, and only where my insights are overwhelmed by scripture and confession can I know myself to be overwhelmed by the Spirit of God. At such moments of responsible decision, he continues, our attention must remain directed solely towards the truth of the word. To focus on the word in such an exclusive way, Bonhoeffer contends, is not to abstract or to distract from reality, quite the opposite. For what is really going on amidst whatever it is that's taking place in the world around us has whatever reality it has only by reference to Christ, who is, as he stresses right through to the end of the prison letters, present as its Lord, conforming it to his gracious will and ways through the humble power of divine love. The work of the present word is always world-making. Theology becomes of worldly use precisely by discerning and keeping pace with this work of the word in its own thought and speech. The struggle for true Christian community and life is thus fought by renewed devotion to receiving the truth of the gospel from the hand of the living Lord of the church. Ingredient in the witness made by the faithfulness, obedience, message, and order of the church, as Barman stresses, will be its supreme confidence in the word of God which has come upon it. And the hallmark of a church gathered in faith around that self-presenting word uh, in this way will be what Bonhoeffer styles as evangelical freedom. The liberty of the church from the godless fetters of this age, again the language of Barman, is a function of the effective presence of its Lord and not else besides. The acuity with which Bonhoeffer perceived and practiced and attested this fact is arresting. Writing in the same summer of 1939, Bonhoeffer explained, he said, the freedom of the church is not where it has possibilities, but only where the gospel really and in its own power makes room for itself on earth, even and precisely where no such possibilities are offered to it. The essential freedom of the church is not a gift of the world to the church, but the freedom of the word of God itself to gain a hearing. Only where this word can be preached concretely in the midst of historical reality, in judgment, command, forgiveness of sin, and liberation from all human institutions is their freedom of the church. On Bonhoeffer's account, when the word of God gains such a hearing for itself, it does so solely for the sake 
of salvation, solely for the sake of the salvation of this world of ours. The church's freedom arises from the word, and as such, takes shape in concrete service to the word's cause in the world. Writing from the prison just a year before his execution in 1944, Bonhoeffer explained it this way. He said, what matters is not the beyond of this world, how it's created and preserved, it's given laws, reconciled and renewed. What is beyond this world is meant in the gospel to be there for this world, not in the anthropocentric sense of liberal, mystical, pietistical, ethical theology, there's a lot of bad stuff there, but rather in the biblical sense, in the biblical sense of the creation and the incarnation, crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Right? Transcendence in the midst of the world, um, uh, precisely to be glossed and, and understood in its biblical sense. The point of a theology of the word of God is that Christian faith is concerned solely with what is given in the gospel. And what is given in the gospel is God for us in Jesus Christ. At the heart, therefore, of Bonhoeffer's legacy is his powerful witness to, to the identity of the God of Jesus Christ as attested in scripture. A God who, coming low to us in humility to save, rightly becomes and ever remains, as his friend Eberhard Betke said, our highest concern, the very basis, measure, and goal of life itself. Thank you very much. <laughs>